محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يس هل في ذلك غسم الذي حل ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين تغوا في البلاد فأكثروا فيها الفساد فصد عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لبالمرصاد فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاذ على تعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأنا له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذبه فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العلي العظيم
صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أم حسبتم أن تدخلوا أن تدخلوا الجنة ولما يأتكم مثل الذين خلوا من قبلكم مستهم البأساء والضراء وزلزلوا حتى يقول الرسول والذين آمنوا معه متى نصر الله ألا إن نصر الله قريب صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم brothers and sisters جميعا um, may I uh, extend my condolences on behalf of all of us to Sahib al-Asri wa zaman on the martyrdom anniversary of our seventh Imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Qadhim alayhi salam. The topic that I have in the limited time that I have tonight that I would like to share with you humbly is seven tools from the Thaqalain for grappling with the most difficult questions in our lives. Of course, you know before that that our Imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he is our seventh Imam and he is so close to Ali ibn Abi Talib in lineage, meaning that he's not so far away. We often forget that our dear Imam is so, uh, is a descendant of Imam al Hussein, is a descendant of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So if we want to introduce the Imam, we'd say Al Imam Musa. Ibn Ja'far, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Ali, Ibn al Hussein, Ibn Ali, Ibn Abi Talib, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And you know Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he is the son of, of course, Imam Ja'far, al Sadiq, but he's also the father of Ali ibn Musa al Rida. His shrine is so famous in Mashhad. And he's the father of Fatima al Masuma, whose shrine is so famous today in the world in the holy city of Qom. The Imam lived at a critical time in history where the Bani Abbas, who came after Bani Umayyah, they were taking or had taken the reins of power illegitimately because they were false leaders. They took the power from Ahl al Bayt. And they were very harsh on the followers of Ahlul Bayt and of course on the Imam himself. They were persecuting the Imam, they imprisoned the Imam for many years and eventually they poisoned and killed the Imam. But that brings me to the significance of what I'd like to share tonight in the limited time that we have. So I hope that you can be quick listeners as well as I be a quick speaker. The Shia at the time of Imam al-Qadim were tested. They were tested with their adherence to the Qur'an and their adherence to Ahl al-Bayt. And the Imam himself, as I said, was persecuted, let alone the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Just as the followers of Ahl al-Bayt at that time were tested, we all have to be tested as well. Our exams, our trials may be different, but the severity of them, the severity of the trials are going to be similar. Where do I get that from? 
I get it from this this uh, blessed ayah. Am hasibtum an tadkhulul jannah. Do you expect to enter the jannah, the heaven? Walamma yatikum mathalul ladina khalaw min qablikum. This lamma means not yet. And the what has passed of trials of those people that came before you of difficult trials hasn't come to you yet. You expect to enter the heaven just like that? Look what the ayah says. Masathum al wa dara. Those people that came before us went through so much afflictions and difficulties. Wazulzilu. They were shaken to the core. Wazulzilu. Hatta yaqul al rasulu walladhina amanu ma'ah mata nasrullah. To the extent they were they were shaken so violently that the messenger with them at that time and the people who believe said, when, when is Allah going to save us? When is Allah going to help us in this trial? And then Allah answers, Ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. The help of Allah is always around the corner and it's inevitably coming if you be patient. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So today in Sydney, Australia, I think our greatest trials are related to our culture, meaning our beliefs and our lifestyle, our practices, to our minds and our mentality, our mindset, and to our hearts. Now, it sounds very general, but what do I mean by that? I mean that we're not in immediate danger. We're not going to be, yani bombarded with a F-16, yani in Elwood, God forbid, that's not what's going to happen. Alhamdulillah. But we are being bombarded with other trials. Because remember, the ayah of the Quran says, What has happened to those before you of trials and tribulations has not yet happened to you. So why do you expect to enter the heaven just like that? So I believe the wazulzilu, the shaking that is happening to us here, the trials that is happening to us here, is related to our beliefs, is related to the ability of the Muslims in Sydney, in Australia, to hold on to their beliefs without being corrupted, without being compromised. And at the core of holding on to your belief, is the question, what is my purpose? Which has been up on the screen for a while. What is my purpose? You see, in luxury societies or well-off societies, let's not call it, that's a bad term, at least for people like me. I'm not living in luxury. But I'm in a comfortable life compared to many people around the world. What happens in a comfortable situation when there's not many difficulties, yani life, day-to-day -day difficulties is that we begin to question our very purpose and our meaning and inshallah this is this is the challenge that we have but I'm going to share with you a few ways seven ways very briefly that we can always use and hold on to these tools when we're asked in our minds the question what is my purpose why am I going to work every day? Why, why am I sending my children to school? Why, 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 why? At the core of it, these questions come during crisis in our lives. We may hear, for example, a loved one is being diagnosed with an illness. And I know people here and myself that there are people like this, of course. And they could be life-threatening sometimes. We ask ourselves, what is my purpose? When we see those images on television, and on social media of newborn babies being slaughtered in cold blood, we ask, what is the purpose? The fragility of human being, al-insan, gets you to ask in those moments of crisis, really, what is my purpose? Where, where did I come from? Where am I now? And where am I going? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
The source of these seven tools that I'm about to share with you, inshallah, is the source of every Muslim of guidance. Hadith of Thaqalain is a very famous hadith that Shia and Sunni narrate it. The difference is that the Shia understand the hadith correctly and our Sunni brothers and sisters have comments about it and oh, it doesn't mean this, it means that. We understand it correctly. This is the understanding. Rasulullah, is, it's narrated that Rasulullah has said, Inni tarikun fikum al-thaqalain. I am leaving behind two precious things. Thaqalain. Coming from the word thaqil, which means heavy. That's why some people translate it as two weighty things. But what it means is two precious things. Inni tarikun fikum al-thaqalain ma in tamassaktum bihima if you hold on to these two, you'll never go astray. What are they? What are the two things that I need to hold on to? Kitab Allah wa itrati ahla bayti. The book of Allah and my ahlul bayt. Wa annahuma lan yaftariqa hatta yarida alayya al hawd. These two ahlul bayt and Quran remain together until they meet the Prophet at the pond on the day of judgment. So the seven tools that I'm about to share are from these two thaqalain. So these seven tools, I'm about to read them and you need to memorize them now, yes? No, I'm just kidding. The first is at-tathakkur, at-tafakkur, at-tawakkul, at-tasabbur, at-tawadu, at-ta'amul, and at tadarra Did you memorize them? Say salawat if you know them now. Aha, no one knows them. Inshallah, we'll discuss it. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first one, tadhakkur. Tadhakkur means to remember, the act of remembrance. Tafakkur, and they coupled together, is the act of thinking and reflection. Where do we get these from? We get them from this blessed ayah of the Quran. In fi khalq al samawati wal ard, wa ikhtilaf al layl wal nahar la ayat li ulil albab. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day, there are signs for people of understanding. Who are these people? What do they do? Alladhina yadhkurun Allah. These people that have understanding, they remember, يَذْكُرُونَ They remember Allah while standing, while sitting, while lying down and resting, meaning in all situations they have dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah. And they also do something else. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ they think about, they reflect over, they contemplate over خلق samawati wal ard This creation around us and including us, they think about this creation and its grandeur and its splendor all the time. And then they come to a conclusion. Their conclusion when they think about these things is not, there is no astaghfirullah creator. There's no meaning to my life. Uh, they become atheists. That's not what their conclusion is. These people have a different conclusion when they study and they examine the universe. And that is, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Oh Allah, this cannot be in vain. This cannot be just heck, as we say in... Uh, in Arab, like heck, like it was just made, there's no real purpose to this creation. La. And then the next conclusion is this, Subhanaka. Subhanaka. Subhanaka is coming from this Subhanallah that we say all the time. What does Subhanallah mean? Subhanaka means glory be to you and Subhanallah means glory be to Allah. What is this Subhanallah? You see, brothers and sisters, when we do tasbih or we say subhanallah, 
in our salat or in our tasbih. What we mean is glory be to Allah from any defect. And this is difficult to understand, but if you think about it for a while, this is our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any potential defect that comes to my mind when I think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely far away from Allah. It's impossible. But we saying subhanallah affirms that impossibility. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah from even what my mind for one second thought about Allah. Or for one second I thought about this creation. What, what's happening in my life? What am I doing? What's the point? Why am I going through these difficulties? Why is this loved one you know, ill or passing away? Why is this happening in Palestine, Masalan? All of these things, sometimes in our lives, or we don't get what we wished we, we would get, we should say, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah, because He's far greater than what my limited brain is imagining of Him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, tadhakkur and tafakkur. The third and the fourth is tawakkul and tasabbur. We, if you reach that conclusion of glory be to Allah, the next step that you do is you rely on Allah. The next step that you do is you have the patience to go through the trials, to persevere when you are asked in your mind or when you when these questions come to your mind rather such as what is my purpose where am i going is there any meaning to my life we have a very uh, oft repeated phrase in the quran wa ala allahi falyatawakkalil mu'minun upon allah alone the way the it is grammatically structured with Allah coming he, there's no time to explain but it means alone upon Allah alone shall the mu'mineen rely upon yes why because he's the creator and he's the all wise and he's the all knowledgeable we have an equation in our minds yes we say I can't understand certain things in my life طيب. Your equation is this, either you think that you've fully understood the creation and the purpose of your existence, or you say, Isn't Allah all wise, infinitely wise? Which one do you choose? Do I choose to rely on my own limited conclusions about my understanding of the world? Or, أَلَيْسَ Allah بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ is Allah not the all-wise, the infinitely wise? There must be a great purpose for my existence and for where I'm going. And there's no time to get into these details. Maybe in the future or maybe you can research it yourself. Open up Surah Al-Kahf kindly in your free time. Surah Al-Kahf, I think is Surah 18. Correct me if I'm wrong. But from Ayat 60 to 82, we hear the story, we read about the story of Khidr and Musa. Every time you open up this story, I've heard the ulama say this, every time I open up this story, I derive new wisdom and new spiritual enlightenment from the story of Khidr and Musa. But one of the things that I wish to highlight here is that Musa alayhi salam, he knew that this wise man, Khidr, was chosen by Allah and he had knowledge from Allah and he did tawakkul in Allah and he followed this man without question. He said, allow me to follow you and you teach me from what Allah has taught you. Will you allow me? And he says, you won't be patient with me, ya Musa. And who's Musa? Musa is one of the ulul azm, the top five messengers. He says, you won't be patient. How can you be patient over something which you don't have a comprehensive knowledge about? And he says, please, give me, yani I'm paraphrasing, give me the opportunity. I'm not going to speak. He says, don't, don't precede me in speech. If you see something strange, 
don't ask me about it until I inform you about it. And Musa says, yes, yes, yes. They go on their journey and Musa sees something that apparently in the fiqhi jurisprudential halal and haram was haram. And he questions the wise man. And the wise man says, uh, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that you won't be patient with me? And so he lacked that patience at that level that if Musa could persevere and be patient, then the wise man was going to reveal to him more levels of spirituality and secret knowledge. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We're going okay with time, alhamdulillah. Because Salat is not too far away. Inshallah, I'll be quite brief. We have three more. So we had Tadhakkur and Tafakkur and Tawakkul and Tasabbur. And now we have Attawadu, which is literally humility, humbleness. Habibi, the guy's side. <laughs> I, I usually say Habibi. <laughs> this Tawadu is necessary, is necessary for us for Allah to teach us and for Allah to give us that spiritual enlightenment and to raise our spiritual status. There's no such thing as pride in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, uh, no one can be proud and expect to rise up in the ranks of spirituality. We have a beautiful ayah. Sorry, not, I, I don't have the ayah here. It says, yes, I do. The ayah is Wallahu Akhrajakum Min Butuni Ummahatikum La Ta'alamuna Shay'a. Allah has brought you forth from the wombs of your mothers while you do not know anything. So what happens that the human being all of a sudden now believes that he knows everything? He reads a few books, listens to a few lectures, and he thinks that he knows that. He knows the ins and outs of the creation. And he says, really, I've studied and I don't see much purpose in my life or meaning in my life. Habibi, like, take it easy. You've been entered or you've been brought into this world and you don't know anything. Allah gave you hearing and seeing and hearts that you may be thankful if you contemplate over the creation. You see, we have a beautiful hadith from Imam al-Sadiq that they say one of the great urafa, Allah Maqadi, rahmatullah alayh, he used to tell his students to leave this hadith on their prayer mats. Okay? This is part of a longer hadith from Imam al-Sadiq from Anwan al-Basri. But the Imam says, لَيْسَ الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ Knowledge is not by reading books and listening to lectures. Now you may say, brother, what do you mean? لَيْسَ الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ yani We don't need to learn? No, obviously that's not what it means. The first level of knowledge is to read some books, listen to some lectures, attend such gatherings. But that's not the end of knowledge. These are terminologies that we're learning, things that we're memorizing. But it's not the truth and reality of knowledge. Knowledge is nur, it's a light. In fact, Imam says knowledge is a light. This light goes into, falls into, is given to the heart of the one that Allah wishes to guide. Now this is the message. In aratta al-ilma, if you wish to have that nur, that knowledge, fatlub awwalam fi nafsika haqiqat al Then seek in yourself the reality of being a slave of Allah. If you can discover the reality of being a Abdullah, then you will have true knowledge. But my point here is that 
that we need to be a slave of Allah. And a slave cannot be proud. A slave cannot be proud. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala wa ala And the number six is a ta'amul, which basically I mean by ta'amul action. Action. You see, the slave of Allah, going back to that narration, he does what he's told. As soon as I know that this command is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't even have to ask questions anymore. That's the higher level of being a Abdullah. I don't need to ask questions, but why do we need to do the Salat like this in Shah Ramadan? Why are we fasting? Yeah, because it has some benefits. Yes, it has benefits. But the main reason why I'm doing it is because Allah ordered it to be done. And so there's so much that I had prepared for this part. But suffice to say that if we wish to discover these higher levels of knowledge and nur, then we need to seek this ubudiyya, this servitude to Allah in our hearts. And that's why I brought this hadith again for action. فَطْلُبْ أَوَّلًا فِي نَفْسِكَ حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَّةِ And then the Imam says something amazing. He says, وَطْلُبْ الْعِلْمَ بِاسْتِعْمَالِهِ Seek more knowledge. Seek further, deeper, higher levels of knowledge by using the knowledge that you already have. Often we already have enough knowledge. We come to the center, we come to the masjid, we listen to more lectures, which is good and fine. But we already have the knowledge. We know that, for example, haram and halal, there's no way to uplift and develop spiritually if we're committing sins. We know that. We already know that. And we know that if we want to advance, we have something called Salat al-Layl, for example. We already know that. We already know that. It's just about the practice. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala ali Muhammad. And the last one is at tadarra which basically means, and I'm running out of time, earnest supplication. Earnest supplication. This tadarra is coming from the word, it's coming from the word of when a baby is desperately seeking to suckle from the breast milk of his mother. You know how babies are, you know, they can't wait any longer. This desperation is connected to this word tadarra, which means that you desperately ask Allah. If you really wish to develop spiritually, and I'm, ask, I'm asking and I'm questioning my own self here as I say these words, then I need to desperately ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide me with that knowledge. Of course, we've already said we need the practice. We need to do the wajib and avoid the haram. And we need to do mustahabbat as well, such as Salatul Layl, or such as Dua Al-Ahd, or such uh, mustahabbat that, for example, for Salatul Layl, the Scholars have said that no one has reached any spiritual station or any achievement unless they have been practicing Salatul Layl. Maybe it's a good thing that my time is running out because I'm emphasizing on certain points which is really the, the gist of what I wish to deliver tonight and leaving out a lot of the details. This Tadarra, the reason I put it up here is because at the end of this hadith, Imam al-Sadiq also advises and he says, yufhimka. Ask Allah to make you understand certain questions that you have in your life about your purpose and your meaning. And Allah will make you understand. Immediately the reply, the conclusion comes, yufhimka. He will make you understand. And we have many dua. You must have heard this one, for example. Allahumma, or Rabbi, zidni ilma. Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. This is definitely something that we need to 
continue to ask for. And brothers and sisters, I'll end with this and say that knowledge when it comes doesn't necessarily, or there's two levels of knowledge. There's knowledge in the books and listening to certain lectures and that's what we call husuli knowledge which we derive from, from listening and reading. But then the higher levels of knowledge is that nur that Allah places in your heart. And the first level of that could be in a real dream. For example, one of the brothers, he was telling me that he saw a dream that one of the shuhada, the great shuhada, came to him and he compassionately hugged him and he whispered knowledge into his ear. This is the nur that we're talking about. This is the knowledge that you don't read in books. Ask for this higher level of knowledge and insha'Allah, Allah will provide it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah salli ala ali Muhammad. So to conclude, the seven tools that I humbly wish to, wanted to share with you is the following. At-tathakkur, at-tafakkur, at-tawakkul, at-tasabbur, at-tawadu, at-ta'amul, and at-tadarra. And with the just a few words on Imam Al-Qadim before Hajj Muhammad comes up to do the majlis. Brothers and sisters, the Imam that we usually hear about, Imam Al-Qadim alayhi salam, we tend to hear that he was an oppressed Imam and he was oppressed Imam. But sometimes some people write and narrate about the Imam in a way that is not correct. They say that the Imam, he left his social and political responsibilities and he left the ummah and he was sitting at home or in a masjid and he was teaching you know some durus and some lessons in islam but he had left the ummah on its own why because they say well he didn't have any followers khalas he left them this is very far from the truth brothers and sisters i don't have much time to explain but seek seek more knowledge about Imam Al-Qadim. And in fact, all of the Imams after Imam al Hussein, they did not sit at home. They did not leave the political life as some Westerners that are writing about Islam are saying or about the Imams. They were inside the affairs of the Ummah. Their job and their mission was to establish justice on earth and the religion of Islam, which is the truth. And so there's no way they can be sitting at home and saying, no, I, I'm, I'm not in politics anymore. I don't involve myself in politics. This is what I wish to say. And in fact, one of the signs that the imam was actively working on the entire community is that when they brought out, after having poisoned the imam, the Harun al lain of the Bani Abbas, he had poisoned the imam after having imprisoned him for many years, they brought the imam out, a few men brought him out on a wooden plank and they put his body before the people in Baghdad so that they can fool the people to say, look, we didn't poison your imam, look at him, he's there. Good. See his body, he wasn't poisoned, he's fine. He died a natural death. The Shia came out in droves. It surprised the Bani Abbas that in Baghdad, under the nose of the Khalifa, of the time, Harun al lain you have now masses of Shia in Baghdad, in the capital of the empire. And this was thanks to the efforts of Imam al Qadim alayhi salam, as our scholars say, and the efforts of Imam Jafar al Sadiq, his father. Our Imams were directly in the affairs of the Ummah. We should never make that mistake, inshaAllah. And with that, May I invite uh, Brother Hajj Muhammad to recite the Majlis Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallallahu alayka ya Sayyidi wa ya Mawlai wa ibn Mawlai
الله عليك يا سيدي يا موسى بن جعفر يا باب الحوائج Tonight we pay our respects to our seventh holy Imam who's buried in Kalvamain. The shrine is a sanctuary for all his lovers, for all the believers. But so I want to ask you, in what state did our Imam live his final days? The dark dungeons of Baghdad were familiar to our dear Imam. For he spent many years imprisoned in them for no reason or crime. But the Abbasid dynasty was notorious in killing and oppressing the Shias at the time. He faced many hardships in his life, yet he never complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is narrated that as they were taking him to jail, he says this dua. Oh Allah, only you know, I used to ask you to grant me the freedom and the free time to worship you and dedicate all my hours to worshiping you, oh Allah. Now that I am separated from people, now that I am being taken to jail, you have given me the opportunity to worship you, so I thank you, oh Allah. They brought the Imam to a dungeon in Baghdad where the Imam could not distinguish between day and night. It is said the God that Harun al-Rashid al-La'in sent to the Imam was one of the most ruthless of men by the name of Sindhi. A holy Imam spent all his days in sujood and ruku'ah whilst he was fasting on a day of the 25th of Rajab as the Imam was fasting it was the time of iftar what do you break your fast with brothers and sisters uh, Cindy brought him some dates so he could break his fast but the dates were laced with poison as he ate the dates that Cindy gave him, the poison entered his body. The color of the Imam's face begins to change. Imam al kazim who had a chain on his neck and a chain between his feet, he passed away from this world. Some of the Shia that came to see the Imam's body, they saw that the bones of the Imam had been bent from the heavy shackles that he wore in prison. Then what does Harun al-Rashid do? Allah, he says, he takes the body of our Imam and he laid it on the bridge in Baghdad for three days so that the Shia could gather and mourn for the Imam. Sallallahu alayka ya Musa ibn Ja'far. But Imam al kazim used to say, La yom ka yomuka ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. The one who was slaughtered thirsty in the plains of Karbala. The one whose headless body laid on the sands of Karbala for three days. The one who held up his infant son, asking the enemy for water, only to be met with a three-headed arrow. 
the one who stood alone on the plains of Karbala. When Sayyidah Zainab salamullahi alayha watches the horse of her brother return from the battlefield with no rider. Zainab couldn't see what was happening on the battlefield. As we know, she runs to the Tal'a Zainabiyya. What does she see? She sees in the distance that a man was sitting on the body of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. She sees a man holding the beard of Aba Abdullah. And he had a dagger on the neck of the Imam. La la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimin. Wa sayya'alamu al-lazina zalamu ayya munqalabin yanqalibun. Insha'Allah we pray by the right of Bab al-Hawa'ij, Imam al-Kazim alayhi salam, to heal and cure all the sick patients to protect our maraja and scholars, to help all the oppressed people around the world, especially in occupied Palestine, to grant us victory over the enemies of Islam, especially to those who are on the front lines, and to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Holy Imam, inshallah, we'll conclude with Dua Al-Faraj. Allahumma salli ala محمد وآل محمد اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين